All right, we'll just start by um, introducing ourselves. So I'm Lydia Dorotic, and I'm one of the practitioners here at Motherwell. I'm a naturopath and medical herbalist. Um, and I specialise mainly in, in women's health and fertility. Um, get all sorts of things coming in the door, stress and fatigue and, and all kinds of things. Um, and with this um, sort of body typing thing, I've, it's sort of like a new kind of tool in my belt now, and I've found it really helpful in my clinic of just really being able to individualise people's health and sometimes when things just aren't working when they should be, now I can see why, because everyone's so different, so it's great to have a, an approach that's not the same for everyone. Not that that's what I did before, but now I've, yeah, so I've found it really great. That's me. And I'm Morella Lascarin. I'm originally a medical doctor, although for the last, mm, I think, 13 years now, all I've done is mind-body medicine in the sense that I look at the emotional conflicts behind physical illness and shifting how people think, behave, and feel. Um, actually, it all started when I came across the system. So I went to a medical conference, and it was presented there, and we had the opportunity to go on a retreat and treat it according to our body types. And to my surprise, to my surprise, um, I had trained in Ayurveda about 15 years ago, and it turns out that everything that was prescribed pretty much matched very much what I had been doing already for 15 years, so it wasn't a surprise for me, but it was like, wow, this um, not only matches what I already know, but it also has got the science behind it. And um, anyway, so the, my interest with it was that once you figure out your body type, you understand why you think in a particular way, why you behave in a particular way. It's not that there's anything wrong with you, it's that naturally that's what you're inclined to do. And, um, and of course, I was finding it very easy to communicate and, and engage with people who are very similar to me, but if they're in the other side of the wheel, that's a completely different species. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was really powerful to actually do the whole training in PH360 because then you totally understand how that person behaves and reacts, okay? Um, so, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm the clinic, so we, I'm one of the co-founders of Motherwell, so I've been running for 14 years, and so it's a multidisciplinary clinic where we've got doctors and nurses and osteopaths and acupuncturists and herbalists and naturopaths and homeopathy and me, hypnotherapy mainly, and strategic coaching. Um, right, so um, this, Tonight's talk is called Eat and Live Right for Your Type, and we had to put eating there somewhere because that's what everybody thinks about what am I going to eat, but it's actually not the main thing. You realize today that there is a lot of talk about the times of the day where things should be done, what's your best environment, what's your best social interaction, and so on. And we start with this slide because these two ladies can't be more opposite. Um, so if you were to run into Valerie on the street, you might even think that she's overweight. You know, according to our current standards of what a healthy body is supposed to look like, you might think that she's overweight, but it's actually a top athlete at the peak of her health and for her body type, she is exactly how she should be. And the same applies to Eliza McCartney. You could run into her in the street and think that she's anorexic, she's too skinny, what's wrong with that girl, and so on, but it turns out that she is not only doing the sport that she'll be doing, but she's exactly in the shape and form that she should be according to her body type. And so, most of us are completely confused because out there you find people advocating paleo. At the same time you've got the ones advocating vegans. At the same time you're uh, hit training combined with, no, you have to do meditation, or no, you have to uh, go and do crossfit, and otherwise, no, you shouldn't sweat at all. You should be all doing calm stuff and paddle boarding and going into a zen state. But guess what? Everybody's right. The person who wrote the paleo book, if you look at the pictures, now that you learn a little bit more, you realize that they're exactly the people who would benefit from a paleo diet. And those who are advocating the meditation and the yoga, and the rest, they're exactly the body type that would do best with that type of activity. So all of them are right because they're all talking and experiencing from their particular body type. And no wonder it is confusing. You get certain body types on a keto diet and you almost kill them. And you get somebody like me to do meditation for two hours a day and I can shoot myself. <laughs> it's not the right thing for me. So um, everybody's right and everybody has had an experience and that's why there's so, ma so much information that is um, confusing out there. 
So, um, as Morella sort of said, there's a whole lot of science behind um, all these body types. Um, there's like a whole sort of about 15 different sciences that have all been pulled together because throughout history we've had Ayurveda, we've had Chinese medicine, we've now got a whole lot of um, genet you know, uh, science going into genetics, um, there's embryology, there's all, all types of science and they've all discovered different things about our health. But we're, we're all none the wiser really, like we're all still as confused as ever. And um, I'm just going to sort of explain a, a few of the terms of, um, you know, the terminology behind it. So you might have heard of epigenetics, it's sort of becoming a bit of a catchphrase. And what that really is, is that we always thought that our genes, that we inherit from our parents, were our destiny. So if we inherited um, particular genes from our parents, that, that's what was going to happen to us. So what happened to them will happen to us. But now we know that we have an incredible amount of control over whether those genes are switched on or off. So we may inherit them, but they may not um, mm -hmm. like, may not show. So um, basically your genes are only really 5% of the picture, the rest of it, your, your lifestyle and your environment are the rest of it. So that's what epigenetics is. Another term um, is what we call phenotypes. So genotypes are our genes. But our phenotypes are what we can actually see, like all of our characteristics on the outside. So without doing any genetic testing or anything, we can actually tell a lot about people by just looking at their characteristics. So the colour of their hair, how long their femur is, um, how wide their neck is, you know, their, where their ears are, if they're attached or not. So all these things tell us a lot about what our, what our genes are, which is pretty amazing. So that's what a, a phenotype is. So this is a classic example of how phenotypes or the epigenetics come into play. So this is a, um, the poor mice who always get experimented on. Um, so these two mice here were basically the offspring of two mice, so two genetically identical mice, mice or mouses, mice. <laughs> Um, so they were both yellow and they were both obese and they were both diabetic. And what they did was they separated the, these two genetically similar mice and mouses, mice, um, and they fed them different. They fed them the same diet, but with one of them, they supplemented that diet with some certain nutrients. So um, these nutrients here, some choline and folic acid and some other bits and pieces. And what happened was one mouse, this is the mouse that wasn't supplemented and turned out obese, diabetic and yellow. This mouse here turned out brown, non-obese and non-diabetic. So that's epigenetics and it's, you know, that's how it, how it works basically. And what they found is that what mums do with their bodies, you know, when babies are in utero can have an effect three generations down the line. So we have a, a huge amount of influence over our genes. So an example here That's is... That's me. So mm -hmm. those are my lab tests. Yeah. Um, so the idea is to really make it um, clear to you guys that the fact that you have certain genes, that, that doesn't mean that you're going to express them. Okay, so I had always been reluctant to check in my genetic makeup. I was like, oh my God, if I turns out to have, you know, to have a gene, then it's going to be a self-fulfilling prophecy and I don't want to do that. But once I got into a PH360, I actually had them taste it just because I wanted to match and see whether it was true or not. And that was incredibly powerful because um, as I talked later on about my body type, you'll see that I'm supposed to be a semi-carnivore. And I actually, my genetic makeup, it says so. You know, it says you won't be absorbing the essential fatty acids from vegetables, so don't even try. <laughs> And there was something else, um, there was another thing, oh, some, I think it was B12, uh, yeah, carotenoids. I couldn't absorb the carotenoids from the vegetables, therefore I needed vitamin A, which is only an animal product. But the interesting one was the vitamin D. So it turns out that I have genes that make it very difficult for me to, to assimilate and to produce vitamin D. So when the results came back, Lula upstairs said, you go and have a blood test, your vitamin D must be down to the ground. Well, I had it done and it's absolutely normal. So, you see there is so all of my genes said I should have very low levels of vitamin D. 
It turns out that they're perfectly normal, so I must be doing something right, okay? Okay, so, um, so as Marilla said before, as we often will focus on food and exercise to, to get healthy or, or get in balance, and while those things are really important, there's a whole lot of other things that play a huge role in turning those genes on and off or um, making us healthy. And for each body type, some of these things are more important than others. So for, for a lot of them, food is, doesn't even factor as, as the main um, thing that they need to focus on. So for instance, um, we look at career. So if someone's in a job where they, are, they need to physically move their bodies and they're sitting at a desk, like as an accountant or an office worker, and they're just, they, that will really affect their bodies because they need to be moving. They um, will probably get quite stressed and unhappy. So that has a huge impact on their, on their genes. Um, some people who, um, for instance, the social aspect is really, really important. So having lots of people around them is, they need that for you know, validation and just um, feeling good and they like to exercise with people and they just, they need people. Other people don't need anyone. They're quite happy just being on their own. So that's, that's really um, good to know, and you probably already know that. Everyone has their preferences. So um, by knowing that we, we you know, don't just need to focus on food and exercise as, as, a, um, as a great tool to be able to add to your, um, to your health kit. So this is a very complicated slide, but basically why I've got it there is um, when I was talking about all the different branches of science, where we've got Ayurveda and Chinese medicine, this one here is um, it's called anthropometry, which is, is basically measuring all these different ratios between different parts of our body and how that correlates to that we're predisposed to different diseases. So what they've found is like people who have a wide um, neck, that they are... Um, predisposed to sort of cardiovascular disease. The length of our fingers even, the two, our ring finger and our index finger, so the ratio between those tells us whether estrogen or testosterone is kind of the, the dominant driver or the hormone that's sensitive in our body. Um, so there's a whole lot of, um, this, this all sort of go, feeds into the background of um, all the body types. So this is another complicated slide, but basically what it's saying is this is embryology. So when, when we start, when we are basically being going from a, an embryo, we have three layers of, um, or three layers within the embryo. So one of them is called the endoderm, one's the mesoderm, and one's the ectoderm. And each one of those is responsible for developing different parts of our body. And what they've found is that some that, that people spend different amounts of time in each of these um, development developmental layers, which sounds bizarre. But when, depending on which layer you've kind of spent most of the time, is where your body kind of is the most sensitive, and we'll sort of see that as we go on. But that's just mm -hmm. where it comes from. Um, I do. So what happened was that I went to a medical conference. And um, as I was telling you, and then we got treated in that retreat as, as for our body types. And so they were presenting the H360 and making us, un making us understand how it worked and so on. And then I knew that Matt was the founder of the H360 and I saw him sitting in the back. And I was watching this guy who was dressed in a suit and he looked very corporate. And I'm like, why, why is he doing this, right? And so I went and I was looking at him and then he turned around and he's, how did you get into this? You look so corporate. And so he told me the story. It turns out that Matt has got a master's in health science and he was, um, his focus in health science was how to train people to optimize their sports performance. And so he became the scientist trainer of all of the top athletes in Australia. And so all these Olympians were his clients and he was training them for top performance so he knew exactly you know because of his training and his habit which body type was better for what sport and what they should be eating and what regimes of exercise they should be doing and so on and he got a reputation for being very good at it and 
out of that, he also has an entrepreneurial mind, and so he opened a chain of gyms in Australia, which became very successful. So he had a lot of money, he was very successful, and he was training all the Olympians. 12 years ago, he wakes up one day with this terrible pain in his leg. And so he goes to the doctor, they don't know what it is, they do multiple scans, MRIs, and in the end they do a biopsy. And the biopsy, they discover that he's got amyloid polyneuropathy, which is a very rare genetic condition in which there is protein accumulations on your nerves. So that pain that he had in his leg was actually the nerves starting to be sort of swallowed by these pools of protein. And that was going to happen to every one of his nerves, and so he was given about maximum five years to live. So at that stage, he knew, well, he had the money, plus he knew all the top epigenetists in the world, and he did a little bit of a world tour to try to find an answer, because the normal specialist would say, you know, there's nothing we can do, it's genetic and so on. So he got told two things. First, you've got a gene that makes you not able to assimilate any protein. You can't eat any protein. Zip, zero, no protein. Now, you probably have never heard of that in the world of nutrition, right? But that was the only way. So no protein, and second, you live in the south of Australia, it's freezing cold, you should move to, the, to Queensland, northern Queensland, so he did. Now, he recovered. Not only he recovered, but he was getting healthier and healthier, and, and this is without eating any protein. So at that point, he had this sort of like epiphany where it was like, all right, I was able to discover this only because I have the money and because I know the people. What if this information was available to everyone out there? What if we could gather up every article that has ever been published relating body types and measurements and characteristics with health and different, um, all the published data and put in a database so people in the world can access it and do something about it. What if everybody could do for their body what I had done for mine? And so he got in touch with a whole lot of big players in the world, you'd be surprised as to the people who were involved in this, and they created the Ultimate Human Foundation. And the purpose of this international foundation is to finish chronic pain and disease by 2050. And one of the projects within that is PH360. Okay, so this is the platform that we will introduce into today. It's actually an online database where you, you get measured up, you go into the database with your particular body type and that reflects to you, we'll show you later what it looks like, but it's it, it, what you should be eating, what exercise you should be doing, the environment, your social interactions, um, where you should go on holidays, actually what week of the year you should go on holidays. <laughs> it's, it's crazy. Um, so your mental profile, when I read my mental profile, and if you do it, you'll see that in the initial questionnaire, which is how you get into the database in the first place, they never ask you anything about how do you think. But then when this profile comes out, it describes how you think. And I was like, wow, this is crazy. Anyway, so this is where it comes from. It actually comes from the idea of, I wouldn't say it's a, a, a charity, but almost. So the whole idea is to make it as accessible to everyone as possible. And so this is, you, know, you want to start with that? Okay, so, um, so PH360 is the, the platform that um, Rowa talked about, and these, this is kind of a wheel basically of all the different body types. So depending on um, when you take, do all those questions and get all measured up, basically there's a whole kind of wheel of possibilities of where you might sit within there. So while you might be a, say for instance, a crusader, there's um, 30, between 30 and 90 degrees where you, you could be sitting here or you could be sitting here, so you're, you man, you're very different from a crusader here to here. So by being able to know where you sit in that wheel um, tells you kind of um, the best things for your body type. Um, and as I talked about before with those layers of the embryo, so that's where these um, mesomorph, endomorph and ectomorphs kind of come from. So whichever layer they had the most um, time in is where they, their bodies kind of developed more. So I'll, I'll go, now we're going to go through each of the different body types and as we're going through you might um, sort of relate to one of them or you might know someone that um, often it's kind of the, the personality things or the um, social things that, that kind of stick out but as we go around um, if anyone sort of has any questions or if you relate to, you probably hear giggles of people, they relate to it. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Um, and the thing is that, you know, there's some people that are a smack in the middle. So for example, I'm just going to tell you, I'm smack in the middle like today. There's no influence in there or anything else. But if you found somebody who's like 145, they obviously have a bit of connector in there, so they behave completely different to me. Um, and so these degrees are the 360 degrees where you can be, but then again, you might recognize yourself as, as one, or you might end up tonight saying, oh, huh, what I want, because some people are in the cost. There's another one, those little lines over there, means that some people might be, what was it, 280 diplomat, mm -hmm. for example. Um, people who fall into the 280 diplomat, they, they feel, I, I feel more like I can eight turns, because some specific numbers have got certain traits that connect them to another type. I think at the moment it's sort of to 10, 10 degrees, isn't it? Or 5 degrees. At 10 degrees. 10 degrees that they're able to, to pick different body types. But the more it develops, they're going to be able to do it down even sort of into more detail. So we'll start with the sensors. So the sensors are down here on the bottom. We're going to work our way around this way. So sensor body type. So each with each of these, we kind of have a, an animal to that sort of depicts their characteristics, if you like. So the sensors are um, depicted as a bird. And the reason for that is that there's not a lot of bone or um, very fine bones, very fine muscles, not a lot of fat. And they're very, um, they, to basically survive, birds have to use their senses, um, their sight, and um, yeah, to, to, get a, to navigate the world. And because they're not physically strong, they have to use their senses too to navigate the world. So senses are usually your kind of long, lean um, body types, and they're probably more like your kind of cake mosses in here, those little tall, muscly, um, well not muscly, but the, the tall, ruler-shaped body type. Um, they have very long fingers and toes. Um, so the, this is, the, you know, obviously various possibilities. So the kind of normal, your yeah, normal um, sensor is that kind of ruler shaped body. So they don't have big huge hips or anything. It's more sort of up and down. And then um, when they gain weight, it's more sort of, I guess, in the middle there. So with the sensor's mind, so the sensor kind of lives in their head because they, like I said with the bird, they're not physically strong, but they are always thinking. So they almost navigate the world through their senses, and they're always thinking. They think their way through life. Um, they they love details and lots and lots of information. So if it makes sense to a sensor, then they will they'll do it. But it has to kind of be a logical, sequential thing. Um, they're very highly sensitive. They don't like. They can be very um, influenced by external things like light or noise too many people around them, they, they kind of like to, because they're always so in their head, they need to almost sometimes shut themselves off from all that external stimulus. And they can be, because they're in their heads all the time, they can be often very creative. So the habitat for a sensor is, because they don't have a lot of fat, um, they derive all their heat basically from outside, so they can often feel the cold. I've had some sensors who will come in and they've got like about five layers of clothes on and like to measure them up we sort of have to get rid of a few of those layers but that's just because they just can't, they can never get warm. So they, um, so their environment is, they need hot or humid kind of environment. They like, um, it needs to be calm, they, they can't stand kind of lots of noise and hustle and bustle. So a perfect island holiday like that is what the sensor would love. So with, um, with their food as well, so because they're, they're cold people, they, they're, all their heat, the heat that they do have is basically all um, taken away from their digestive system because their brain is using all that energy. So their digestive system sort of struggles sometimes to digest that food. So they don't have that kind of fire to, to break down their food so they can get um, irritable kind of conditions in their, in their tummy. So they, if they have, they need to have very well cooked food. So raw foods are not great for sensors, and anything warm is perfect because the warmth basically warms from the inside out. Um, and small portions and snacks for them. So socially, as I said, they um, 
it, like if you're at a party and the censor was there, they'd be having a kind of deep and meaningful in the corner with their friend. They're not, they're not the ones on the table like taking their clothes off. <laughs> they're the ones that just like to have a quiet, it's just too overstimulating. Um, they're very independent kind of people. So what can go wrong with censors? Like I said, their digestion can really be affected if they're um, if they're eating like lots of raw food or food that's hard to break down and then, and it's not warmed up or well cooked. They can suffer from um, anxiety obviously because they're you know constantly thinking about things. And something that, that does happen when senses are really out of balance is that they can suffer from fatigue and um, and get sick often. So I've had a couple of people like this where they've come in, they're just always sick all the time. We've tried all the usual things to get their immunity up. And then now that I and you know worked out these senses, it's like a whole you know a whole new thing. It's like you need to be warm. You need to you know find ways to um, detach yourself from everything. You know, like warm baths and things like that. So I would have never thought to recommend something like that, but it makes a huge difference. So. Um, with sensors, um, they really need to protect their spine, so because that can get damaged. So, lots of sort of um, stretching exercises, um, things where they use their mind. So, like ballet, um, yoga, tai chi. Those kind of exercises are great for sensors, and they're not. Um, they're doing lots of stretching and all of those as well. Right. So the next group. So imagine the wheel, you just have the sensors, now we've got the crusaders. Now a crusader, what does the name sound like? A crusader has got a crusade, right? They've got a goal. And that's what characterizes a crusader. And the animal that is compared to it, it's, it's a horse. And the horse is going to go until it gets over there, right? Tends to be, the crusader tends to be quite slim as well. It's got a bit more muscle than the sensor. But if you look at the muscles of a crusader, see how fibrous they are? It's those people where you can see well-defined, very fibrous lines of muscle. They tend to be um, cyclists, marathon runners, anything that goes and goes and goes <laughs> and goes until the end, to the end, right? Um, so long lean body, lean muscles, great for, they've got a good endurance for those long distance runs and cycles and stuff. They actually benefit from doing repetitive movements. So they're the ones in the gym doing, I don't know, one hour of cycling, or, you know. Um, the crusader body, so the, this would be the normal, okay, so quite, tendency to be quite toned naturally, and they're the ones who eat and eat and never gain weight, same as the seamstress, they, they have a hard time gaining weight. But of course anyone can go overweight, these white guys will tend to accumulate in the belly, you can't see much happening in the legs or in the arms. Mind of the Crusader, go! So this guy, Steve Jobs, was definitely a Crusader, and not only because of what he did, but we can see it in his body, see how lean he was? Mm -hmm. And actually in every picture that you see of it, there's something about the jaw as well that to, to be quite pointy. Um, a lot of men are crusaders, much more than women. Okay, there's a higher proportion of crusaders amongst men. Um, it, that has got to do with the every body type has got a leading hormone. Okay, so we haven't mentioned that because it gets into it too complicated. But these guys are run by basically adrenaline, testosterone. It's it's gold. Okay, um, and dopamine is what really makes them. Uh, it's the hormone, neurotransmitter in this case, of reward. So whenever they achieve a goal, they get this burst of dopamine, and so that's what makes them really light up. So you've got a whole lot of leaders, visionaries, high frame function, they love everything with full detail. If you have, a, for example, we have had a crusader client and they want to know everything, and tell me where that came from, they're highly skeptical, and they're gonna go and read the reference where that came from, okay? And they're very driven. They love to have a target. Actually, there's nothing worse than a crusader without a mission. And we've actually had a recent case, this was unbelievable. This was the most anxious person I've ever seen. Like, like she came to me for hypnosis because of the anxiety. And then we figured out it was a crusader without a mission. And it was, it was much worse. I've never seen, I've seen anxiety a lot in the but this was much worse. And I've, and I've had another one too where 
um, was a student that had studied for six years full on and was nothing, no problems. As soon as she quit, or as soon as she finished, she manifested all these things you know, and she couldn't work out why. And it was because she, she was still, she was working, but a very boring job, which she was kind of doing it to save money, but she didn't have a mission anymore. So mm -hmm. we were getting her a mission again to... Mm -hmm. to and, that, and that's all it takes. And yeah. you're doing all these different things to sort out their health problems and all they need is a mission, something to to go for. And they totally relate to it as well. As soon yeah. as you say that, they're like, yeah, yeah, I need that. <laughs> <laughs> um, socially, crusaders, have, they haven't got really a problem with socializing, it's just that they can't be bothered. <laughs> you know, they're so into their mission that if the person next to them can help them get to the mission, then they'll be more than happy to spend time with them and come on, let's work together, we're working on this mission. However, if that interaction is going to, not going to bring them anything good for the mission that they're looking at, they, they're perfectly happy to ignore the person right next to them. So, so sometimes they come across as rude or completely aloof or, you know, they're just selfish. I, can't, I cannot imagine that living with Steve Jobs would have been a pleasant thing. And if you read about him, he always said, you know, in business you have to be aggressive and you have to chop in the way and da, 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 because everything was about the mission. Um, and they're highly independent, they're just into their thing, right? The habitat, again, again, quite slim, not a lot of muscle, so they, they like to have warmth as well. Um, in this case, um, they need to get outside in fresh air, and this is one of the big things with crusaders, that they're so into the mission, they forget to eat, they forget to go to the toilet, they forget to go and take a break, they don't exercise because it's not part of the plan. So a crusader actually needs somebody else to go and hey, you have to get out there and get some fresh air, otherwise they're prone to migraines and all sorts of neurological disorders as well. Um, so they need to go outside on a regular basis. Again, because it's a mixture of this one, it's a bit of a, a lot of head still. The digestive tract wasn't very well developed either. And so again, you need preferably cooked foods and um, smaller meals at a regular intervals. Um, a lot of crusaders forget to eat, or they eat whatever. It's the ones that you know they're eating a banana while they're still, still typing on the laptop, and this is not the kind of food that will be nourishing them. They need hot, cold food. Um, what will happen? Well, again, they forget everything, and I've seen. You know what I've seen quite a bit in this type is um, people with chronic fatigue. They push so hard and so hard and so hard that the body just goes at some point. The next group would be, again, a little bit further in the wheel, the activators. So what do you think an activator is going to do? Huh? Activate. Let's come on, let's go and do it. Let's go, let's go. It's the action people. So the animal that represents them is uh, some form of cat, and the cat will jump into action, do what needs to be done, and then probably go and sleep for the rest of the afternoon. Yeah. Um, so a lot more muscle, um, these are, so we're, we're now going into the, um, the, body, the two body types that have got more muscle are the activators and the connectors. And so you can see a lot more definition of muscle. If these people go to the gym, they get quite toned very easily. Um, medium bones tend to be shorter in stature. So if you, there's an interesting phenomenon, if in a room you distribute people according to the body types, you're starting to see that the activators and the connectors are shorter. Okay, same source, crusaders, and then we're going down in stature. Uh, so this would be the normal one, uh, more of a square shape, not a lot of curves. So I'm an activator, so quite square, not a lot of curves anywhere. <laughs> um, you know, but, um, but again, you know, I'm known for being the, come on, let's go and do it! <laughs> um, so this weekend, for example, I, because I've got nothing else to do, I train to be a Zumba instructor. <laughs> you know, I thought, well, I can't find me anything in the gym that I like, so what am I going to do? Yes, I'm going to do a Zoom instruction course, and then I'm going to invite all the neighbors to come over and have a class. Um, so that's, that would be very typical activity. Um, the mind would be adventure, give me something new, variety, anything dynamic. It would be the extreme sports people of the world, completely the slight routine, they need variety all the time. They love a challenge. So if you've got a group of activators, give them a challenge and you know, figure out how they're gonna beat the other team, that's a very activated thing. Oh, rules exist to be broken. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it was really funny. Um, the other day I was in a dance retreat 
and um, so they were playing the music and it, it was about sort of like, okay, dance like you're the animal that you need right now, a bit like in, you know, invoke the animal totem that you want to acquire. And she said, choose a wild animal, and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, nah, I'll do my dog. <laughs> and I was like, activator. Um, can be easily distracted because if anything new appears, then well, I'm gonna do that. So that reminds me to, um activate my daughter's an activator and that kind of thing there was a she went on this school challenge where there's a team where they have to like perform team oh, activities geez, yeah. and she she can't bear not to win <laughs> and the whole team there was this big pike and they had to push a ball along and they were holding it up and they were you know it was everything was going wrong and she was getting more and more frustrated because yeah. I'm getting behind so she just picks the ball up runs to the end of the pipe and just runs along by herself and gets the, you know, I mean, she, she just like bugger the rules, I'm going to win on my own. And, yeah. you know. <laughs> and the motto for an activator would be do, do first and think later, which can get us to a lot of trouble. By the way, every body type has got good things and bad things, okay? Mm -hmm. So, you know, very good at action, but then uh, I have stopped up quite a number of times because of that factor. Um, socially, again, it's all about variety and adventure and luck. If they've got somebody around them who's willing to do the same thing, then they'll take them along, otherwise they'll go and do it alone. Okay, food-wise, so activators and connectors, but mainly the activators are the ones who are carnivore. So very short gut that doesn't digest vegetables very well. Um, and we do a lot there with having some animal protein in our food. Now, I did try going vegetarian in my 20s. It was a catastrophe. Okay, I've never been sick yet. Um, five to, four to five meals a day, and not to be skipped because we get hangry. Okay? Um, and lots of antioxidants. The, the metabolism and activators all constantly producing free radicals, and therefore there's a tendency to get um, oxidation in the body, which then leads to things like arthritis, a lot of problems with inflammation. The ideal habitat, I'm definitely in the wrong place, it would be warm mm -hmm. and dry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> definitely no wind, activities get very aggravated by wind. What things that tend to go wrong? Well, the activator body was made to move, and so you get an activator in a position where they're sitting at a desk all day long, they go seriously insane. So I've had a number of people with fibromyalgia lately, which I'm realizing, looking at them, oh my god, these women are activated. Actually, I've got two at the moment. And what has happened is that life has put them in a situation of, of, I have to be in this job because I've got this commitment, this commitment, this commitment, and the mortgage, and so on, and they're not moving their bodies enough, and then they get fibromyalgia, okay? Um, and also things like fatigue. You see people with fatigue because they haven't moved enough which is really interesting. And as soon as they start moving again, they recover their energy. Connectors is the next group. So again, in the mesomorphics as well. A connector would be represented by a dog. Why? That is just mm -hmm. going and greeting mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. Yes, you're wonderful. Oh, <laughs> someone else. <gasps> You are my favorite thing today, you know? And so you will recognize connectors. They're the ones who know everybody. Do you have friends like that? Yeah. I've got a couple and it's like, oh my God, how, how do you know so many people? And not only do they know them, they know them well. You know, they remember everyone's names. And um, so connectors are as well, they're um, in, the, in, the, in the body types that have got very well developed muscles. Now notice the difference here, you see the curves? These girls have got curves. Yeah. And Richie is definitely a connector. So if, has anybody seen that documentary about his early days? That documentary came out about two years ago in the movies. He was actually a chubby little boy. But when a connector trains, and they've got huge capacity for sports because they've got not only the, the energy of an activator, but also the endurance of the other groups that you will see, the solidity, the strength. They're fantastic athletes. And what makes him a very good captain is that Richie is always looking at what everyone else is doing. It's not him who has to stand up. So they're fantastic sports people. Um, so medium bones, again, shorter in stature, and um, lots of muscle. 
they, t they tend to look a little bit stronger than an activator. By nature, connectors are multitaskers. They can handle many things at the same time. Actually, they thrive on variety as well. So they'll be the ones who are like, you know, doing three jobs at the same time, or they're the ones in the company who are doing various roles. They're fantastic at doing that. Socially, they just love people. A connector suffers if they're alone, okay? A connector who doesn't, a lot of connectors would tell you that they hate sport, but probably because they've never tried doing a sport with other people. <laughs> you get a connector with other people and they'll do anything. And that is one of the tricks. A lot of, you know, the whole mentality is you'll go to the gym and do your routine on your own. That doesn't work for a connector at all. Now you get them into a group doing something together and out they are. And that's one of the big challenges of connectors because they require a lot of exercise and if they don't do it, they will gain weight, okay? Um, interestingly, I just, we just finished a lifestyle program that I'll talk about later on. And these were all people that we had referred by doctors because they had um, some form of metabolic syndrome. So they had high blood pressure, high cholesterol, they had cardiovascular disease, they had, had heart attacks and so on, okay? So this is for 13 people. Out of the 13 people, two were connectors. Now interestingly, one of these ladies had like the perfect diet, the perfect exercise, she had done everything right, and it turns out that her social life was full of catastrophes. 73, six children, always a drama in the family. If it wasn't the children, it was the grandchildren, and at 73, of course, she was always looking after somebody dying, or she had just been to a funeral. And so it was the only thing in her life that was really, really causing the, the problem in her was her social environment. Once she became aware of that, she was like, oh my God, okay, I need to go and find myself some friends who actually know much better state for doing happy things. I need to go back to dancing, to meditation, to yoga, to having fun in my life so I can sort of counteract all this negativity in my social environment. Food-wise, now we're getting into the body type side. Okay, so for the previous body types, often food is more like a fuel. You know, I could say it's like, okay, give me some food, then I keep going. And a sensor would be more like a delicate little thing, things here and there. An activator would be, I just, again, grabbing something on the way to the, to the race. For connectors, food is a matter of enjoyment, and they'll sit down with their friends and have a lovely good time, okay? And so that's one of the dangers as well. I had a client years ago who had, um, so she was really obese, and then she had um, an operation to, to a you know, gastric bypass. And then she found that she lost all her weight, but then she started getting, getting the weight again. So what had happened was that her whole family was obese. Every Friday night and Saturday, she would go to her sister's houses where they would sit down and watch TV together and eat chocolate chip cookies. And because that's what he, they did as a group, she was stuck in that routine and she couldn't get out. And so she was gaining the weight, but she really wanted to have a baby. She could not afford to gain the weight again. So what had to be done was for her to find new friends who were engaging in exercise and make friends over there. And then she, she um, lost the weight again. So what do you think the trick is for connectors? Find the friends who are doing what you want to do. That would be the best thing to do. Really, and it's, it's enormous for connectors. Connectors are a little bit, are still sort of warmish, but also template climate, so ideally Mediterranean, you know, sort of like warm days and cool nights. They're, they've got now a little bit more body fat to sustain the cold, and they thrive on that type of climate. Again, exercise, they, they're amazing athletes because they've got the endurance and the agility and the flexibility. They do, have a capacity to do incredible, so all these people doing like the multi-race and you know, like awake in the jungle and that, those are connectors. Um, lifting weights is good for them, um, moderate to heavy, and they can do longer or interval cardio, high volume of training, group exercises ideal for them. What tends to go wrong is what I, a little bit what I told you with my lady before, they are chameleons, so if you're suffering, and I'm a connector, I'll be suffering for you, like physically, in my body. And if you're grieving, then I'll feel it, and I'll feel it just like you. And so they go like that, and they're everybody's best friends, so you can imagine that they're collecting everybody's sorrows, 
and they're not very good at actually offloading themselves. Okay. Guardians. So we're coming around to my side of the wheel now. <laughs> we're on our opposite side. So the guardian types, these are, um, they're depicted by a bear. So bears are like very strong, um, they conserve energy, so they're, they're big and they conserve energy and they're very nurturing and giving. So everything about a, a guardian type is about um, giving and conserving. So they have um, physically their, their features, they can see all of these have like quite broad um, jaws and faces um, and they, they tend to be um, sort of more like kind of large and round or square. And they, their bodies are kind of quite big up the top as well as down here so they can carry a lot of weight up the top here. So. Um, Valerie's probably a, a guardian type, so she's she's very big and strong. So out of all the types, they're the, the strongest, but they do tend to carry the most weight as well. And because of where they sit in the wheel, they have um, a tendency to sort of um, blood sugar regulation. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so as I said, see here, they tend to carry weight not just down here, but up, up the top as well. So socially, for guardians, that's a huge thing for them as well because they, their whole purpose in life is basically to give without wanting anything in return. And as we talked about before, there's a sort of a hormone that um, sort of related to each body type. And for guardians, it's um, the hormone called prolactin. And that's the hormone when um, mothers give birth and prolactin sort of you know, fills their body and that's what what makes your uh, milk flow. And so that milk flow is all about giving. They don't expect anything in return and that's basically what a what a guardian is. They just they want their friends and family around and they will always they'll be the one that will always be there for others. And if you do, if if guardians don't have that then that's a big problem for them. So with, um, with the guardian mind, as I said, they, they love to look after others and they'll often be in jobs where they are giving to others. So they'll often be teachers or nurses or counsellors or um, therapists. So anything where they're giving to others, they really enjoy that. And they're very um, sort of loyal employees as well, but like they don't like to let anyone down. They'll, you know, when they come to see you, they want to do things to please you. So that's kind of quite a good way for them to keep motivated. Um, so guardians, for guardians, food is pleasure. So for other types, they, it's just fuel or they just eat because they need to keep going. For guardians, they just love their food and they love having food with their family. It always has to be in a big group. So um, they love you know, big social gatherings and having family around. Because um, guardians have a very, like a really long digestive tract, they can actually go a, a long time between food. So whereas some people need um, to eat meals sort of five to six times a day or three to four times a day, guardians can actually get away with eating two to three times a day, even just two times a day. And they, they do do well on fasting and also vegetarian diet. So they're the, the type that does really well with vegetarian food. Um, as I said before, they, they, they're, because they're sensitive to sort of glucose and carbohydrates and sugar, they do suffer for, you know, mostly from you know, diabetes or metabolic syndrome. So for them, like carbohydrates are, are not kind of recommended. For guardians, um, they do prefer a colder climate. So as you sort of come around the wheel, kind of the climates become cooler. So because they can, because they've got a lot of internal heat, they do prefer a colder climate. So in terms of exercise, guardians do, um, sometimes they will, you know, they might have been exercising, like doing lots of cardio or running, and those kind of exercises just don't really achieve results for guardians. They need more kind of weight bearing exercises. So, like with Valerie, she's you know really strong. She's got all that kind of 
um, you know, with shock put, she's had to, you know, do lots of weights. And the reason for that is because when they're, um, whenever their environment is under threat, so their environment in terms of their family, so it could be their children, it could be their, their mother or their sister or whatever it is, if anyone's having problems or if there's like financial problems that are affecting the family, they will actually conserve weight just from that stress. So even if they're eating like they normally are, if they've got that stress, they'll conserve that weight. And it's, it's kind of an evolutionary thing where um, when, when uh, you know, say there's a famine or a war or something, the guardians are the ones that can keep on going without needing anything. So they'll be running to the sensor to help them because the sensors will only last a couple of days, whereas the guardians will be around for you know a couple of weeks because they've got that energy to just keep on giving. So the same with like their all their um, their joints when they feel that weight from weightlifting, that actually sends a signal to their brain that it's safe because there's weight. Their body actually likes that weight, which is quite a bizarre concept, but that's the way it, it works. Um, and you know, once again, they like to do their exercise with family and friends. So the things that tend to go wrong with guardians, so this is actually like really validating for guardians because they've spent their whole life usually like <coughs> being the fat kid in their class or trying to be like, you know, the norm, the, you know, that the skinny kind of active, muscly person and they just, their bodies just aren't made like that. So when they, when they see that actually this is what their body is and their body is made to give and to be nurturing, then they actually feel like, I really like, I wouldn't want that any other way and I'm, you know, I'm okay with my body the way it is. So what, yeah, so what tends to go wrong? So their body type's not trendy, like in the olden days that used to be perfect kind of body type. Um, they do have issues with blood sugar, so um, diabetes is, can be an issue. And also they, yeah, they don't like to exercise online, they need to have that family and friends around. So the diplomat, so this is the, the last body type, this is what I am. Um, so the diplomat is sort of depicted by a bull, and um, the bull kind of is very sort of one way, and they can be sort of strong and, and stubborn as well, but they also sometimes will need, because they will stand there for a really long time, they often need a push to get them going. Um, so both of these, um, so Xena and the Rock, they're both diplomat types, and as you can see, they're both quite different body types. But because they sit between the Guardians, who are the kind of the bigger body type, and the Senses, who are the very small type, there is quite a big variety in, in the different shapes and sizes of body types. And I've, I've found that when people don't really relate to any of the types, that often they are a diplomat just because there is such a variety within that, that group. Um, they, yeah, they also have very strong bodies and they have the ability to, to build up muscle, but it does take them a bit longer. So the diplomats, they do tend to put the weight on around here, so from here to here. And it can be quite, especially the, the diplomats towards the guardian end, it can be quite difficult to shift that weight. So the diplomats mind, um, so with a diplomat they think a lot as well, like a sensor, and they will like to gather a lot of information before they make any decisions. And sometimes they spend a lot of time gathering information and gathering information. They don't actually make a decision. Um, so they, they like time. They don't like to be pushed or have pressure. They like to make a decision in their own time, like to do everything in their own time. And if they're pushed, they just they almost just back down and they can't deal with it. So their bodies, they want to, often their bodies, their minds are kind of want to keep doing stuff, but their bodies are just like, and go slow. Um, they, some, yeah, they often have a strong sense of justice as well. So with a diplomat, it's really important that they, they have a lot of low stress around them. And like Morella said, she, you know, if someone told her to meditate, she wouldn't, you know, she'd rather be shot. 
for me, like that's just perfect because I need to slow down. If I slow down, my body responds and I'm actually able to do. And if I try and push myself and do more, then my body just resists and I can't. So it's you're just honouring that um, part of me. So diplomats um, also socially, they're like guardians, they like to be around family and friends, but they also really like their own time, so they need time to kind of just have their own space, they need lots of wide open, they've got lots of nods at the front here, <laughs> um, lots of wide open spaces um, to have their own time. Um, they often don't want to be leaders, they, they like to, they're happy to follow the pack because they don't like to make those decisions for other people. Um, with their environment, they will like a cooler environment and um, with humidity. So going for walks like in the bush or at the beach is a perfect thing for a diplomat because they need that kind of moisture in the air. And the big wide open spaces. And that's, that's probably one of the most important things for a diplomat is to have that, just, that space. So in terms of diet for a diplomat, so they're very much like the garden in terms of they do well on a high vegetable diet, but they do they do need protein as well, but they need lots and lots of green leafy vegetables and lots of things that they can chew. So that chewing motion is just very like slow and steady and it's almost like a meditative thing for a diplomat, so that crunching kind of thing is great for a diplomat. Um, their pancreas can have difficulty with sugar as well, so they can have blood sugar problems. So keeping away from, from carbs is quite good for, well, especially for the diplomats towards the gardening, not so much for the sensor. So the sensor as well, they, I didn't talk about that, but they're the one type that does well on carbohydrates because their brain uses a lot of um, fuel and they need, so you know, none of the diets at the moment sort of say you should eat carbohydrates, but the sensors actually they do need more. So in terms of exercise, so this is a huge um, change for diplomats. So in the morning, diplomats are very, they, they're very slow and they need to be slow in the morning. And it's not until the afternoon when their bodies will really start to pick up. And that's where they, they get the most from their exercise. So from sort of three to six is where um, diplomats do well. And lots of um, strength work, getting their, um, circulation going, because they'll often have sort of lymphatic issues, so making sure they're getting that circulation going. So what tends to go wrong with a diplomat? So we've got here, when they can gather so much information, they don't make a decision, so they often will need, they, they can be likened to sort of like a cruise ship, so they sometimes just need a push to make that decision, um, because they, otherwise they'll just keep on gathering facts and analyzing things and they have blood sugar problems as well. So, so just, just to, um, before we step into that, so there's six body types, right? And why if we were, who here are things that you're living as, like a spiritual spirit living a, an experience as a human body? Oh, no, no. You know, or you know, we came to do something. I presume. I don't know. Okay. Maybe, maybe it resonates with you. Maybe it doesn't. But what, what if you came here to do something in particular, and you had chosen your vehicle? What if you had chosen the right vehicle for the thing that you want to achieve? That's pretty much what's behind PH three hundred and sixty. That's how Matt put it. It's like if we came to the world to achieve something, what would it be like if we had chosen exactly the right vehicle for that purpose? Exactly. And what if in every project you could, instead of having a say two crusaders, you imagine two crusaders with my brother, come on mate, let's do it, yeah, that, yeah, and go, yeah, yeah, and go, and go, and go. <laughs> so these are the typical politicians who choose for the whole town and they haven't heard the opinion of the elderly, they don't know what the women want, they don't know what the children want, they're just doing their own thing. Or you get three activators waking up project, yes man, let's do it, come on, yeah, blah, blah. And then again, there's no concern for what other people want, they don't care if they're offending someone. Um, if you had two sensors, they'll probably be creating for days and days and days and days and days. It's the most beautiful and harmonious project that is very complicated. Um, if you had just 
guardians. They will probably be meeting every day and having some beautiful meals together <laughs> and wondering what they're going to do for the community. If you only had diplomats, you probably had them sit around the table for days. Actually, one, one of the women in my, pro, my last program was saying she stepped into, um, I think it was the scouts, the scouts, um, sort of general board, and that board had been together for something like seven years trying to decide on one project. And then she stepped in, she's more like nature, and within one month it was all resolved and done. Okay? And now after she did the whole PhD 60, she was like, oh my god, they were all diplomats. So you can imagine a whole table full of diplomats where everyone is analyzing every possibility that can happen. It goes and doesn't go anywhere. So if you were to work on a project, really what you want to have is a little bit of age. Yeah. And what if you want, you know, you've got families like that, you find that in the family. You've got the thinker, you've got the grandmother who's the one who does all the cooking, you've got the actor who says, come on, let's go on holiday, it's somewhere fun. you got, and that's the ideal thing. And we are all here in our personal beauty and magnificence. And so if we could only understand this, then not only will we feel better with ourselves, but then we'll be a lot more productive because everybody is doing what they're good at doing. And accepting of others. And as well. accepting of others, mm -hmm. exactly. You know, um, my my Amy, who does the programs with me, she's um so she's a connector, very close to activator. So actually, uh, we're like this all the time. And she's like, oh my god, after 18 years of marriage, finally I understand my why my husband. <laughs> so she'll go to her husband and she'll say, hey, mate, what are we doing? What are we doing? What's your gut feeling? And he's like. What gut feeling? <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? He's a diplomat! No wonder! <laughs> and the same thing with children. So um, Lydia was saying, so Lydia being a diplomat and her child's an activator, mm. so Bess is all like, come on, that's good. Yeah, and Lydia's like, ah. And I just get tired watching her, and I'm just like, and now we are, like, we, I've just explained it all, and she goes, oh, that's right, then you need to sit down and, you know, be quiet. So we understand each other, and I understand she needs to move her body, and she's not just doing it to be annoying, She's and she needs to eat, because she's always wanting to eat all the time, so she gets hangry, so she body needs it, so we kind of understand each other. We've got a whole mix in our family, my husband's a crusader, and he drives me nuts. <laughs> he'll just like, you know, he'll do his project and he's just, you know, on the go. He digs, you know, under the house for three weeks on end. He doesn't eat. He comes and I'm so hungry. I'm saying, but stop. And if I did that, it would take me four years. Because I'd <laughs> do a couple of bits and then I'd come inside and kind of check him out now. And it's not my style. So we kind of complement each other, but we used to drive each other crazy because I wouldn't finish things or put things away, whereas he would always finish everything and he didn't. So yeah, we get each other now as well. So. It helps, I think, like these, um, you know, it's even really good in counselling, um, couples counselling, because people actually can understand that you can't change someone, that's the way they are, but you can learn to live with each other. Yeah. And respect each other. Well, and work with it, you know, <laughs> make that work for you, because it actually makes me do stuff, because he's, you know, gets things finished, I'm like, okay, well, I'll double my really hands, so I'll finish it, and it actually helps me. So don't pressure me, I can't do it with that. Yeah. So we're going to show the platform now. So this is so everything that we've been talking about is this online platform where basically you get your measurements. It's a questionnaire, and then you go into the platform and you come up with a specific number. And this is who you are, and it um, it would tell you exactly for the number of what foods, what mind, place, talents. It's not there, but it's on the mind. There's a part called genius. And in genius, it tells you with your body type, with your physical capacities, with the way you think, uh, the way you express yourself, what would you be really good at? And it's fascinating. I just, I love it. So this is, this is what, well, this is the, my platform here. It's L for media there on the top. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's quite a lot of detail, but basically in each... Each part of those, that wheel, what I was talking about, your social, your environment, your food, it, it takes you through what's the best for your actual body type. So even now in terms of um, fitness, it will tell you the times of day. Oh, we haven't talked about that today. So the, the guardians and the diplomats, towards that end of the spectrum, they're more night owls, 
So these are the people who do their base work at the end of the night, and they tend to go to sleep quite late, and they're very slow to warm up in the morning. So ideally, and this, I've heard stories like this, got, um, diplomats trying to lose weight for years and years and years, and going to the gym in the morning and killing themselves, doing all this exercise, and then when they discover pH for 60, they wake up at 8. <laughs> And they, they don't exercise until the end of the day because that's when they're supposed to do so. And just by doing that, and actually they're not doing the old cardio training, they're just lifting weights at five, six o'clock when they finish work, and they lose like 20, 25 kilos, something crazy, mm. just by changing uh, those times. Mm. And the, the more activated things for in Crusader kind of spectrum is more the early birds. And that's the other one, you know, if you've got a, if you've got a, a crusader married to a guardian and they have this ongoing agreement because they don't go to bed at the same time, this agreement, sorry, it's supposed to agreement, and then it makes sense because finally you realize, well, no wonder the, the sensor would be knackered at 9.30 at night in bed, whilst the, um, the doctor, diplomat will be watching Netflix until 2 in the morning quite happily. Mm -hmm. That's in their natural fire rhythm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, um, there's, there's so many things on the platform, but this this is one where lots of people are interested in looking at the, the foods, and it even tells you that the foods, why they're um, really good for your body type. Um, Click on that new food, I find that fascinating. I mean, this new uh, food. Yeah, so spinach comes there, you click into why, and it would tell you exactly why it is recommended mm -hmm. for you. And here you can't read it, but it says reference, and if you click on that, it tells you what scientific papers that information came from. And there are some foods, I'd be surprised, when I, when I was looking at my one, for example, beetroot is not one of my recommended ones, it's an avoid, and I was like, beetroot? <laughs> Why would that be? And then it came up for my particular body type because beetroot is diuretic, and I'm already dry enough, like I need ex extra water, so beetroot wouldn't be recommended for me. So some things that you think are really nutritious, and they've got a famous story in their um, when we were trained. You know, this woman where this what, 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 what she had the, the girl with the kale, all sorts of autoimmune conditions and so on, blah blah blah. And she was having these organic kale smoothies like morning, lunch, and dinner. No. And it turned out that kale was like yeah. no, no, don't do that. And as soon as she stopped the kale, she got better. No. So you can see how powerful that is to you know all these foods that we told good for us and you know while well, they do you know fruit and vegetables are good for us but actually some of them are better than others so they'll they'll go through the foods that you can you know you should eat a lot of you should eat them every day and then there's other foods which you, you know probably like the kale would be fine but maybe once a week or twice a week something like that not constantly every day whereas like for me spinach is excellent so that means I should just cram as much spinach as possible into my diet but then there's other foods that that, that I shouldn't they could make family cookies. Yeah. Yeah. Yes yeah. and no. It's interesting because it just some. It might be, for example, if you've got a family where you've got a guardian, and you've got um, a what could be the opposite, a crusader, I guess. Mm -hmm. Then you make sure that the crusader has got cooked foods. But it could well be that you're doing the same spinach except the guardian's having it raw, mm -hmm. and then you're cooking mm -hmm. a bit for the crusader. So anyway, that's coming. Okay. So in there, in the foods, you've got a place where you're going to recipes. And right now they're working on producing the meal plan for the whole family. Oh, wow. So you can actually make, they're working on that, that's the next update and that's coming in the future. Um, so you can click into recipes. Let's suppose that you don't know what to do with spinach and you can click into what specific no, recipes. I'm excited to use because it's in detox mode. But, um, <laughs> yeah, so they're all, they have you, you know, whether it's excellent or not, and you can make shopping lists and and yeah. for example, when we went to the retreat and we had the six types there, it was really funny sitting at the table with all these people and we were, we, they actually had the chef who was making the food for us, according to our body types, and it was just slight variations of the same thing. So for example, I remember I had like chicken with, I think it was potato mash and some um, pumpkin, and then the diplomats would be having a soup of potato and pumpkin. Um, with a little bit of, of, I think it was sprinkled with chicken as opposed to chicken being the main, the main thing. So it was just little variations of the same um, basic ingredients. Mm -hmm. And do you think kids usually have the same body type of the so, one of their parents? No, mm -hmm. no, definitely not. 
pretty funny. Yeah. You know, I've seen I've seen guardians with whoop, they put a little sensor. Now you can't really tell the body type. The, so the platform is not designed for under 18s. Mm -hmm. You can only start measuring people um, from 18 onwards. And again, when they're growing, they're being exposed to all these hormones that are going to shape them. Okay. Um, so yes, you can have an inkling. This kid has to be an activator. So the, all the ADHDs in the world, I'm sure, they're activators. They <laughs> can't sit on their bones for the whole of the school hours, and um, they need to exercise. They need to be out there and burn the energy. It's just because they can't, they can't pull it in. But um, they're developing a program now for kids too, so that you know that will be so powerful for teachers to know. So they're like the sensor kids who just, you know, they need to just sit in the corner and be quiet and then the activators need to get out and do exercise instead of being labelled as ADHD. Mm -hmm. That's really a powerful information yeah. Yeah. for teachers and parents, really. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah, and so no, not necessarily. You don't need to, because you might have had a grandmother who was a sensor and they knew that it was a sensor child, so we've seen those. So Lydia has got a, a activator child. Mm. And it might be the result of you, him being a crusader, and you're a diplomat, and that comes a activity. Because <laughs> I would often think, where has she come from? I no, she's not just, <laughs> just don't relate at all. And you know, like when I said, she's very blunt. Like she gets into trouble at school a lot because she just says what she thinks. And mm. I don't know how many times I've been called from the school because she doesn't accept authority and she's just like, she just says, she doesn't And that for a diplomat is a killer. <laughs> I, I just cringe when I see the number again, I'm like, what has she done now? But she just, you know, she just says before she <laughs> thinks. <laughs> and that gets her in a lot of trouble. <laughs> Sometimes I want to go in and explain to the school that she's just an activator, but I think, yeah, it might be just something else. <laughs> <laughs> Do you find, um, you know, the, the foods that you crave, yeah. Do you know anything about whether they're the foods that you need or don't need, or is he, do you need to see it? Um, it depends what you put, like often if it's a sugar craving, then that's kind of a habit, sort of thing that you're, right, yeah, yeah. you know, you're so used to sugar and it, and it's, it is like a drug really, it's that, yeah. you know, and often when people give up sugar they don't miss it anymore. But then there's other things like, you know, naturopathically you might even say when people crave like chocolate, for instance, that's a magnesium deficiency. I don't really know in terms of the body types whether there's cravings as such, but I do know often when people, when you tell them the foods that are good for them, they will often remember a time that they've tried, you know, maybe a particular diet that had that kind of food. They go, yeah, I remember feeling really good on that. Right. Yeah. yeah. So it's not, yeah. And it depends on the body type as well. We had a, a very overweight Honecta in a group. And um, and connectors love variety, just like the activators, right? And she she identified that what was happening is that she loved the crunch, and so she was eating chippies and everything that was crunchy. Ah. But as soon as she figured out, okay, I really need to go into more vegetarian, she started cutting pieces of broccoli and carrots and having the same effect. Yeah. And her <laughs> craving was for crunchy because the rest of her life was so settled. That's so interesting. And and like as well. Like, what I was saying about each for each type, it's not always the food that's the most important. It's often, you know, like for instance, again, it's the social aspect for the connector. It's the, um, you know, being connected to people. Um, for senses, it's you know. Oh, we had we had another connector, for example, who was isolated. So she had decided to do an online university program, and she was sitting at home studying. Her cholesterol was like. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> so not good candidates for online so learning. I, I suppose you need to know what body you are. You yeah, know, yeah, 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 ideally. And yeah. then you can yes. understand yourself. Yeah, so the way to get into the platform is that process. You have to do the measurement, complete the questionnaires. Actually, it takes about an hour to get the whole information in there. Mm. Um, and then it yeah, tells you exactly you what number you are, what type you are. That's how it works. Yeah, then you can get access to all your work. In the fitness section, for example, being an activator, um, so oh, there's something else called it, the power hour. And so in that power hour, it's really vital that you do what you're meant to be doing. So an activator is supposed to be exercising between three and four. I'm like, oh dear, how am I going to do that? But between, you know, at three thirty, have a break when I'm working from here, and this thing has got videos. Well, it tells you that, but also little videos of what you can do in fifteen minutes. And it makes a huge difference. You're just the 15 minutes of doing this or that, a little bit of music, and, and it, it, you know, it, it helps.
has got a platform for the fitness as well. Mm -hmm. If you're not much into the gym thing, then you can sort of translate what they're trying to say with that and say you're, you're more an outdoors person than you because I am. Yeah, well, you just select no gym kind of. But yeah, and, and my body type is like between five and six is my power hour, and I'm asleep, which is perfect. Because um, that's where my hormones are. In, in the morning, not in the afternoon. <laughs> but that just shows that sometimes I do get up at five because I've got to get to work early, I've got work to do, and I just really struggle for the whole day. So I, now I honour that kind of like sleeping until at least six because I know that it will affect me for the rest of the day. Mm. Mm. But it has a big impact. Um, many, many, many years now I was like the um, Rosacea three uh -huh. days. Uh -huh. And I, I always believed that it will go one day, but I didn't figure it out yet. <laughs> I couldn't make up the now. When it really makes me uncomfortable. <laughs> well, it could well be that there's something that you're doing or reacting to a food or anything else. Yeah. It's hard to tell. I mean, some people are really obvious, like some sensors walk through the door and you're like, oh my God, that's a sensor, or some diplomats are really yeah. obvious. You know, like the southern man, that's a diplomat. <laughs> <laughs> Tall, strong, quiet, you know, you know, most of those characters are, that, are um, quite obvious. So a guardian, a, a, a pure guardian is very easy to tell, but most people are a mix, or there might be a number that is sort of in between, so it's really difficult to, to tell straight away. So have you got else? Nope. Okay, so um, so I've put up there knowledge is only potential power because we, we all know that you know, people say knowledge is power but actually you can have all the knowledge in the world like Google will tell you whatever you want but it's only powerful if you actually do it. So we all know that eating fruit and vegetables and drinking lots of water and exercising is good for us but a lot of us don't do that. Um, and, w and why is that? It's often because we have like habits that are ingrained that we will always do the same thing that we've always done. And our brains do that because we, I mean, Morella will, you know, she, that's what she deals with, is like the subconscious brain, is that your brain it always wants to be safe and so it will do this what it's comfortable with. And to make change, you kind of have to almost develop different pathways in your brain and that takes a lot of effort. So you have to have like a powerful enough reason to actually make that change. And once you have that, then it, it kind of gives you a reason to, to move down that pathway. So, um, yeah, just going into the, you know, we're talking about getting measured up and things. Both Morella and I, we both work with PH360, we sort of, we use it slightly differently. So the way I use it in my clinic is I, um, use it with my clients one on one and we um, we get them measured up and so I usually to, um, encourage people to sort of have three sessions so because one thing is you get measured up and you get on the platform which is like a year's membership but then you've got you're faced with that same dilemma you've got all this information and you're just like well where, where do I what do yes. I do mm -hmm. so um, so I always encourage the three sessions so we can really focus you in on where, you know, focus out what your why is and, and get you some goals and things like that. So the first session that I spend with people is, um, takes about an hour and a half, so I measure you up, get you on the platform, and um, we look at, you know, basically what your life looks like now, what you're eating, what, you know, where you're exercising, are you doing any relaxation, um, what are... Um, what are your issues? What do you want? What do you want to have more energy? Do you want to, you know, not get cancer like your mum did? You know, all those kind of things we look at. Um, and this is the most important: is really honing into what your why is. And it's often the things that you know people will say, oh, "I want to lose weight because I want to feel good," but that's not really the real reason. So often, the real reason is something to do with what you really value in life. And it could be that. Um, say for a guardian, is they, they might not be interested in like looking good, but they want to be there for their family. They don't want to die of, you know, have diabetes or have their legs chopped off. They want, they want to be there for their family and they'll let everyone down if they don't. So for them, that is a huge why. So you create a statement that that is your why. 
so that when you're faced with making these changes, that, that can be a bit scary, but you've got that, you know, you've always got that in front of mind. The second session, so behind the platform, as a coach, you get access to kind of a lot more detail about each, each person, and um, we sort of are able to put together sort of charts like this, so it'll tell you sort of the distri distribution of, you know, when you eat, and the types of, um, so say, this looks like a, a guardian type of thing, where, you know, the carbs and things are eaten in the middle of the day, and then not much at the end of the day. So it gives you a really good visual of how you distribute your food throughout the day. And then um, you get a report basically showing you the timings of things, the things that are really important that we focus on. So what we call it is the biggest bang for buck. So for some people it will be food, for some people it will be social. Um, and you know, working out what your biggest bang for buck is so that we can get that changed and then that will have a huge impact on everything else. So I had like one woman um, who came to one of these groups and she was, she was like, no, I'm a diplomat. Like she was like, I just I don't have energy and how you know, she related to that. And then we measured her up and she was a um, connector. And I was like, oh, you know, it doesn't seem right. But actually what happened when we did all this, um, we did the coaching and we really dug in deep to what a connector was and what she was missing in her life. It was that she, she, was, she had no connection. Like a lot of her friends had moved overseas and she was really stuck just with her, um, with her family. She didn't have any other friends. So now we're working on that and that's, that's making a huge difference. So once we work out that, that bang for buck, and we would never have known that if we can sort of measure her up. Um, you have your power hour, so what's the most important hour? And just make up some, you know, your personal rules for what's the best for you. And then the last session, we um, yeah, just make basically set your goals, so things that you can work slightly towards, and some people can work faster than others. Other people need more guidance and things, but just working out what are those goals for you. Um, and breaking any limitations as well, because we all, you know, we can do all this, and then people go home, yeah, I'm gonna do this, and then they get home and they're like, oh, the chocolate biscuits on. I just, I just today I'll start tomorrow. You know those kind of, and it's like going through all those things in your mind when you're faced in that decision. Why did you do that? So really honing in on behavioural aspects, and then also what happens is in the platform when you get measured up, these are all the things that are measured. You um, basically it's all plotted on a graph, and as we progress, we re-measure you because your platform actually changes as your body changes. So once you start losing weight or toning up, then we measure you again and your whole platform will, and the logistics and algorithms in the back kind of recalculate. You'll come up with different foods and it's quite incredible. So with my package, so I have the, the three sessions, so that's sort of over, depending on, it can be every couple of weeks or longer, depending on what people are wanting. Um, and what I do with what I'm going to do tonight is to throw into that coaching package a naturopathic consultation as well. Um, so normally all of that would um, come to 757, but tonight, if anyone wanted was interested in signing up, um, I'm reducing that down to 495. So that's that's the way that that's my coaching package. And Morella's got she's got a more of a group. Been going on with her PH 360, so she can talk more about that. So, um, I had a dream for a long time uh, in medicine, and medicine is well known by everybody that no pharmaceutical drug cures anything. We know that. Doctors know that the only thing that really changes your health and cures disease is a change of lifestyle. And so um, there's only a few places in the world where they've actually managed to, to create programs that really change, transform, or reverse disease. And I always wanted to do one of these. And about three years ago, I moved out west. So I live in Riverhead. And, um, and now I have this amazing place overlooking the river. And I just made building for it. And so I got together with a local health coach. And we designed this program actually for people who's, who really need to do something about their health. And they have decided that they're gonna take 
a day, no, not a day, it's actually four hours every week in a week in a program that lasts nine weeks. And we call it My Good Life. And it's a group program um, with a maximum of 13 people. And the one that we're about to start starts on October 17th. Um, so in a month, it's a month away. And and so it goes for nine weeks, and it's four hours every week. And so you'll be wondering, what are you going to do for hours? Well, the beginning is introducing people to the PH360 platform, measuring them up. Every individual gets their access to the platform for a year, just like with Lydia. And then what do we do the rest of the time? Well, we're going to go bit by bit, going and dismantling that platform so that everybody understands exactly what to do there with their personal profile. We do what I baptize as mind shift sessions. Um, so that's my area of passion, is why do we do what we do? Um, so for example, a connector who's a people pleaser came to that personality style, not only because of their genetics, but also because maybe they were a middle child who was always trying to please someone. And until they break the pattern of always pleasing, they, they can't do for themselves what they need to do. Okay, or for example, if it's if it's somebody who's giving, 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 and never receiving, maybe that was their way of getting love to start with as a child again, and that worked well when they were little, but now it's killing them because they never get any time to get any knee time to go and do any exercise class or anything like that. So that's what we call mind shift stations. It's done in the group, which means sometimes you need a mirror. Um, um, actually, you coined that term for me, thank you, Julie. You said that people have a blind spot. And it's something that we do repeatedly that is very obvious to everyone else, but you don't see it. <laughs> Until you see someone else, do, someone else doing it, and you go, aha, uh -huh, that's what I'm doing. And that becomes really obvious in the context of a group. And so typically the mind shift session would be me catalyzing the coaching in front of everybody. And the beauty of doing it in a group is that these people become your best mates. Okay? So we, in the groups that we have worked together, there's always this, you know, people finish the, the, the group, program being very good friends. Um, the last My Good Life that we finished, we finished in July, and there's the Facebook page of constantly sharing what they're going to do, now they're doing walks in the forest together, let's go to a class, blah, blah, blah. so they end up being very good friends. And the other thing that you get in those four hours um, is what we call tool experiences, <laughs> for try a, try a new move really. And it would be that, um, you know, just try something new. Maybe you haven't done Tai Chi before, um, or a Zumba class, or go to the gym as a group and go and do what we need to do as different body styles. And so in every session, there is that introduction of movement. That's a fun thing. A lot of people have got the idea that fun is, I mean, exercise is to be boring and grueling. And this is quite the opposite. So what happens after, over those nine weeks is that people rarely sort of like, you know, we start thinking, I'm the only one with problems, and I've got weight issues, or I've got this rheumatoid arthritis, or whatever. And in the group, you start noticing that actually we're all human beings, and we're all going through a journey, and it's quite normal to have a challenge, and then you see the other person overcoming the challenge, and you become the support group. So we found that extremely effective. Um, so um, completely different uh, approach. Um, again, it requires for somebody to decide, I'm going to take Wednesdays for this. So it's team to two on Wednesdays. And that's a, I understand that because of it, which is not necessarily a bad thing because it means I'm doing this. Um, that would be the normal price for it. We're going to do it 50% off, and anyone signing off tonight is 587, which is for 36 hours of two people working, not about price at all. So <laughs> Amy. Amy's my co coach in this program. And uh, yeah, we've had a very good time doing it. Um, just to finish it off, you can be anything you want to be. Even, you know, be, you can find a way to do what you want to do. And so this is an example. Look at that body of Bruce Lee. I mean, and, and that's probably, that's not even the real Bruce Lee. That one is the, the mannequin that was made out of it. But if you look at pictures of Bruce Lee, he's this tiny little body, these little muscles that pop here and here. So that guy was definitely not a connector and actor. You know, none of the ones that fall into the athletic type. I don't know if I classify him as a crusader. I don't know. I don't know, but definitely not one of the athletic fun. It's the base martial artist in the history of martial arts. How did he do it? Okay. So he used his gifts in a different way. And the other one is opera. So she's an obvious guardian. 
Now, Oprah's story is that she doesn't have a family. And a guardian with a family, without a family is almost like an oxymoron. They suffer without a family. And um, what did she do? She became the mother of everybody. Okay? So, um, in, the, in the day she realized that she could do that, she became a very happy woman. If you, if you listen to Oprah in the early days, she was quite bitter. Ooh, that's your sign. What does it say? I just quite liked that. So it's basically, yeah, when a flower doesn't bloom, you fix the environment in which it grows, not the flower. Ah. So you don't have to fix yourself because you are perfect the way you are. You fix the environment that you're growing in. Yeah, something more shady. And that's how we optimize who we are by putting the environment that we need to flourish. Cool. Mm -hmm.